is Judges chapter 15, starting with verse 1. The word of God says, Later on at that time of wheat harvest, Samson took a young goat and went to visit his wife. Remember last time we left off, he was in the process of getting married, and things went down, a, a, a gamble, a bet that went awry, and he basically left his bride at the altar. He did not finish the wedding ceremony. He left in the process of it. But uh, sometime later, he comes back, and he says, I'm going into my wife's room, but her father would not let him go in. I was so sure you hated her, he said, that I gave her to your companion, most likely one of the Philistine companions that was given to Samson during that wedding ceremony, about 30 of them. Isn't her younger sister more attractive? Man, Scripture's so shallow, isn't it? Take her instead, Samson said to them. Uh, uh, sorry, take her instead. Samson said to them, this time I have a right to get even with the Philistines. This time I have a right to get even with the Philistines. I will really harm them. So he went out and caught 300 foxes. I don't even know how you catch 300 foxes, but... A man must have had super speed as well, right? He catches 300 foxes and tied them tail to tail in pairs. He then fastened a torch to every pair of tails, lit the torches, and let the foxes loose in the standing grain of the Philistines. He burned up the shocks and standing grain together with the vineyards and olive groves. When the Philistines asked who did this, they were told, Samson the Temanite's son-in-law, because his wife was given to his companion. So the Philistines went up and burned her and her father to death. Samson said to them, since you have acted like this, I swear that I won't stop until I get my revenge on you. He attacked them viciously and slaughtered many of them. And then he went down and stayed in a cave in the rock of Atom. Let us pray. Father, this is going to be a challenge. And we ask for your Holy Spirit to give us understanding as we peel back the layers of these passages, as we look to discover your will, your perfect design, and, and what you want for our lives. May we learn something that is life transformative. We trust our lives, our ears, our eyes, our hearts with you right now. Give us revelation. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen. amen and amen. This time, I have a right to get even with you. Last time, maybe I lost my temper. Last time, maybe it was my fault that I, I, I put myself in a situation. I created this scenario. I gambled, you know, away some of my money. And so maybe when I murdered those 30 men and took their clothes, maybe... Maybe I was wrong for that, maybe. But this time, no. I have a right to get even. Now, his issue shouldn't have been with the Philistines. His issue should have been with his father-in-law, right? So why did he think it was appropriate to burn down all the Costco's, all the Walmart's, and all the Targets? Right? Why did he think it was an appropriate response one individual wronged him, and he decided he was going to make the entire nation suffer for this one man's sin. Now, of course, what they did to the father and his daughter, again, I can't stand by, but this is what happens in humanity. This is what happens. We, we experience this all, all the time. If you push me, I'm going to push you back. If you hurt me, I'm going to want to hurt you. If you cheat on me, I'm going to want to cheat on you. I mean, this is just natural. In fact, it's actually biblical. Isn't it God who says in the Torah, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth? Isn't that what he gives to Moses, inspires Moses to pen? The people would be governed by this principle. Now, some would argue that this principle was necessary in a very vicious world because as you see, what Samson did was an eye for an eye, was it? What Samson did was not tooth for a tooth, was it? 
So when God gives them this instruction in the Torah, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, in the context of the, of the nation surrounding Israel, this was very merciful. Because there were people that if you plucked out my eye, I'm going to kill you. And God says, oh, no, 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 wait a second. Guys, we need to have some balance here. It should be even. And wouldn't you argue, wouldn't you argue, argue that getting even is justice? Right? Getting even is justice. In fact, that's why many of us are okay with the depiction of God at the end of time being flaming angry with those who rejected his grace. He's simply being just. The wicked will reap what they have sown. This is one of these principles that we've always stood by. So it doesn't matter if God in the end seemingly looks like he's losing his temper. People are getting what they deserve in the end. My mama used to always say it like this. Y'all probably have, were raised in the same way, that God don't bless ugly. That's what she would say, God don't bless ugly. And if you pushed her a little bit further, she said he ain't too fond of pretty either. And so Samson is clearly working within a certain framework of justice in his mind. And of course, once they kill the father-in-law and his former fiancé slash wife, depending on who you talk to, he then now believes he's not going to kill two people to get even. He's killing thousands of people. He's taking everybody out. The question I have for you, is this just? Is this justice? How else is Samson able to perform such feats of great strength? What and who must empower him to do so? God, right? Is this God's justice? If you punch me in the face, I'm going to cut off your head. Is this God's justice? In fact, to complicate matters worse, what does Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount? In the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, what does he say? You have heard it has been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you this. What do you tell us, Jesus? This is probably a second to the last slide, Mama Mavis. What does he tell you? But I tell you this, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. So Jesus says, you've heard in the past, but I tell you this. But Jesus, weren't you behind what was said in the past, right? If you believe in inspiration, didn't the Holy Spirit inspire Moses to write these words, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth? So why is Jesus coming around and saying, yeah, but I tell you something different? Okay, so what is the ideal family? Is the ideal an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth? Or is the ideal not to resist an evil person, to turn the other cheek? What is the ideal? What is the ideal? Is it situational ethics? What is the ideal? Is it okay for me to harm someone who harmed me on certain occasions, but on other occasions, maybe the Sabbath, I won't do it? Because this principle that Jesus preaches in the Sermon on the Mount is not applied in the book of Judges at all. And the same Holy Spirit that Christ is sharing with the congregation, the people of his day, were under Roman oppression. The Romans weren't more gracious than the Philistines. They were murdering Israelites. They were abusing people physically, emotionally, mentally. 
I mean, this was going on all throughout history. Any nation that dominated another nation typically did not have a lot of mercy and grace. So when they, Christ talks about walking the second mile, because Romans would grab Jews and say, hey, take my luggage. I don't want to carry it anymore. And there were consequences if someone didn't do that. If a Roman were to strike you on your face, he said, just turn the other cheek. The point I'm trying to make here is that why does it appear that God is one way in the New Testament under the same circumstances, but wholly different in the Old Testament? So going back to Judges, let's look at verses 9 through 11. Judges, verses 9 through 11 in chapter 15 says, The Philistines went up and camped in Judah, spreading out near Lehi. The people of Judah asked, Why have you come to fight us? They said, We have come to take Samson prisoner, to do to him as he did to us. Is that fair? According to the Philistines, is that fair? Eye for an eye. He murdered us. He killed us. He took all of our crops, destroyed our economy. We are now decades behind because of him. We want revenge. It's only natural, right? Only natural. We want to do to him as he did to us. Then 3,000 men from Judah went down to the cave in the rock of Atom and said to Samson, don't you realize that the Philistines rule over us? Bro, We've accepted our fate. They're bigger, they're stronger, they have, they have more weapons than us. What have you done to us? He answered, I merely did to them what they did to me. What's happening right now? What's happening right now? You pushed me, I'm gonna push you back. You spit on me, I'm gonna spit on you. In fact, it's worse than that. They keep, they keep trying to outdo each other. Samson, I mean, his form of justice is scary. If you stepped on his toe, you might lose a leg. He's definitely not following the Torah here. As, in verse 14, as he approached, as he was approached, as he approached Lehi, the, he agreed to be bound by his comrades. He said, you can buy me, he said, but don't you guys kill me. They said, don't worry, we, we're just handing you over to the Philistines. And as they were approaching Lehi, the Philistines came toward him shouting. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him powerfully again. The ropes on his arms became like charred flax, and the bitings dropped from his hands, finding a fresh jawbone of a donkey. Remember, he's not really supposed to be messing with dead stuff, right? Now, some would say, well, if we're Nazarite, it's only dead human beings, not necessarily dead animals. Well, and even when you look at the Torah, there were certain things that even Israel was not supposed to be messing around with. So he takes this jawbone of a donkey, he grabbed it, and struck down a thousand men. Now, I'm going I'm to be real honest with you. When I used to read this as a kid, I thought this was dope. I used, I'm a superhero fan, right? I liked comic books. I, I, can I be honest with you? I love revenge stories. I, I don't even want to tell you what some of my favorite movies are because you would judge me, but I love revenge stories. I'm all about righteous indignation. And my mama was a Bruce Lee fan. My mama loved her some Bruce Lee. Enter the Dragon, Chinese Connection, Fist of Fury. Oh, and I loved in Chinese Connection when, when he goes to the school where they're training because somebody, somebody's responsible for murdering his teacher and he shows up and the entire class surrounds him. And Bruce Lee does this. Ooh. Oh! Ooh! Oh, I used to get so excited. He started taking off his, his garments. Oh, you could not mess with him. And they all surrounded him. Oh, do you remember all those back where it kicks and everything like that, roundhouses. You guys should watch it this Sabbath. Anyways, <laughs> I used to pretend I was Bruce Lee. I loved playing with my brothers. Oh, I loved it when I had my toys. I always had a moment 
when everyone surrounded the hero, and he would do this. And this is what I imagine Samson doing with the jawbone, like a lightsaber. Come on. Ooh. Ooh. Takes out a thousand men. And after this battle, it says in verse 18, because he was thirsty, he cried out to the Lord, you have given your servant this great victory. Must I now die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? Then God opened up the hollow place in Lehi and water came out of it. And when Samson drank his, drank, his strength returned and he was revived. So the spring is called in Hakor. And it is still there in Lehi today. Samson led Israel for 20 years in the days of the Philistines. That's my pastor. In fact, in, in the Hebrew, and the King James translates it this way as well, it doesn't say that he led, it says he judged Israel for 20 years. He was a judge. He was their superhero. There was no Justice League. There was the Judges League. And all of these characters were like national superheroes. And Samson stands out because he had the super strength and he could take out armies all by himself. What an amazing spiritual gift to have. Except today, that spiritual gift would never be revered. Not in church. Can you imagine if the Spirit of God came upon me and I stopped preaching, but all I did was fight crime. You know what they would do? They would throw me in prison. They wouldn't celebrate me. In fact, you would tell all of your children, yeah, Pastor Henderson, we will never, would never listen to his sermons again. He's a hypocrite. Do you know what he did to that poor man who was accused and convicted of harming children? Do you know what Pastor Henderson did to him? You would want me to allow justice to be served by our courts. You would rather trust law enforcement over a servant of the Lord. What if Jesus came like this? He showed up, and the first time a Roman put his hand on him, Jesus broke his arm. Don't you touch me. Christ didn't give this speech about, don't you know my Father in heaven can send legions? No, no, no. Jesus says, I wish you would touch me and see what happens. What if Jesus decided that this was the form of justice Rome needed? Wouldn't it be fair? Wouldn't it be just? Do you know in history one of the first judicial moves that Pilate made? It's not recorded in the gospel. It's other historical documents that one of the very first moves that Pilate did as the governor of Judea was to randomly select 200 men and crucify them. Showing up at the Galleria, showing up at the Americana, and randomly selecting 200 men, that's your father, that's your brother, stripped, scourged, and crucified because he could. A man like that deserves to die. A man like that should be tortured himself. A man like that deserves Jesus to use his heat vision. Yes, Revelation talks about his eyes being like fire. He has heat vision. Jesus should have showed up. I mean, by 12 years old, Christ had already seen brutality. And he should have let the Roman Empire know what's up. You are going to respect my father. You're going to respect his chosen people. You're going to respect his holiness. You're going to respect his temple. And yet Jesus comes with this very soft, unsamson like approach. Turn the other cheek. Do good to those who harm you. What do we do with this, family? God seemingly endorses violence and retaliation in the book of Judges, inspires it, 
The Bible tells, it, tells us that we read this in, in, in the earlier chapters that, that the parents didn't know that God was moving through Samson, making him want to marry a Philistine woman. Later on, we're told that, that he's, he's, he's with prostitutes. We're told that he puts himself in more precarious situations and there's more violence and it all seems to be inspired by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The question I have for you, is it? Is it really Jesus? If it's not Jesus, because it's not Jesus' way, who is it? Yesterday, last week we were challenged with this idea that we can actually use spiritual gifts for evil. The spiritual gifts that God has blessed you with can be used for evil. The gifts that God blesses you with are gifts. You do not earn them, right? They're not given to you because you deserve them. You do not merit them. They are spiritual gifts that God bestows upon people, and you have the choice how you want to use it. I'm going to submit to you that Judas, at times, did not use his spiritual gifts appropriately. I will tell you that Abraham, at times, did not use his spiritual gifts appropriately. I will, I will submit to you that Moses did not use his spiritual gifts at times appropriately. The book of Acts tells us that, that he thought by military action he could secure the freedom of the Hebrews. That's what that book of Acts says. Stephen, on trial, is giving a history of the people of God, and he says Moses, being trained as an Egyptian prince, knowing all the matters of warfare, was hoping that by murdering an Egyptian for being abusive, all I'm going to say is he was getting even, right? All I'm going to say is he was being fair. All I would say is that Moses was being just. And he thought by his act of justice that the Hebrews would want to follow him and rebel. They did not. So Moses misuses, misuses his gift, his intellect, his wisdom, and has to go into the wilderness for 40 years, becoming a shepherd, almost forgetting his education. He's so humbled by the time God shows up, and this man is 80 years old, he's so, he lacks all the confidence in the world. He says, I can't speak to Pharaoh. I barely know the language. I got a stuttering impediment. Now, I'm, I, I, I have a speech impediment. I, 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 I have my brother talk. What happened to confident Moses before? God has to wait until he's so humbled that he can finally be used again. And when God uses Moses, God has the power to do everything. He doesn't call an army to ransack Egypt. He sends some frogs to annoy them. Even in these moments, God is trying to find the least destructive way of getting their attention, winning their trust, so that he can lead them. In fact... When Moses loses his temper at the end of his ministry, God has to remove him from leadership because his violent outburst was a misrepresentation of the character of God. And he says, no, man. Moses said, come on, no, 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 I just had a moment. Mm, it was more than that. They're now afraid of you. And if they're afraid of you, they're going to be afraid of me. No. Step down. So how do we get to this point in the book of Judges that seemingly God is okay with this? I am going to submit to you today God was never okay with Samson. He was never okay with it. But why would he give him his Holy Spirit? Because that was a spiritual gift that he gave Samson. And Samson, just like you and me, had a choice on how he wanted to use it. Now, you're going to say to me, but pastor, the Spirit of God only came upon him in these moments. No, 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 no. No, no, no. When we get to the end of Samson's life, he has to pray for God to give him his strength back. Because Samson always had access to his strength. That's why at the end of his life, he has to pray for it because it was taken from him. At this point, Whenever he got angry and he wanted to, you know, become the Hulk, because that's exactly how it happened. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. 
basically what Samson is saying, and he hulks out, it was a misuse of the power of God that he blessed him with. And this happens all throughout Scripture. I actually believe, according to Hebrews chapter 1, that in the past God spoke through prophets in many different ways, but in the past, you know, this is how he chose to speak to us, but in, in the present he speaks to us through his son Jesus Christ, right? That's, that's, a, that's Hebrews. That's probably the last slide. That's the last slide. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. It says, he now speaks to us through his son, whom he appointed heir over all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The son is the radiance of whose glory? God's glory. And the exact, the exact precise representation of his being. In other words, Samson was never the perfect representation of God. Neither was David. Neither was Moses. In fact, David's representation of God was so off-kiltered that he wouldn't even allow him to build him a church. He said, let me build you a sanctuary. He says, no, nah, bro. You got too much blood on your hands. Wait a second. You authorized all this. Did I? Did I? You're the one that was counting your soldiers, counting your fighting men. I never asked you to do that. You should have never been leaning on an army. You should have been leaning on me all along. But Lord, you made me king. No, no, I never wanted there to be a king in Israel. I was your king. Your people insisted on it, and I chose the best among you, and you were one of the best. Unfortunately, you still ain't good. No, you will not build me a temple. Okay, 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 God, okay, okay. But God, you allow for this. Okay, okay, but watch this. Just because God is willing does not make it his will. Just because God is willing to accept your will, your decisions, your path, your choices, does not mean it is God's perfect will. In fact, I would submit that probably 95% of Scripture is God's permissive will and not his perfect will. Joseph didn't need to go to Egypt in order to save the world at that time. God could have done it from Cana. Had Joseph not been sold into slavery and been raised as a leader in Egypt and brought all his family over to Egypt, they would have never been enslaved. Right? But God needed the storehouses of Egypt. No, he didn't. I own a cattle on a thousand hills. It's always mine. If God wanted to rain grain from the heavens, could he not do that? But Joseph said the brothers meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. God just knows how to work in our awful, bad, sinful situations. All things work for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. But just because God can make something good out of your bad ingredients did not mean those ingredients came from him. Right? Let me give you a story. Let me give you a scenario. Turn with me. Turn with me to Jeremiah. Let me give you a story. You're going to love this. Jeremiah chapter 25. Jeremiah chapter 20, 25. You're going to love this. You're going to love this. But this will serve as a rubric to understand most of the Old Testament. Jeremiah chapter 25. God is speaking through the prophet Jeremiah. And listen to what he says, starting with verse 3. For 23 years, from the 13th year of Josiah, son of Ammon, king, of Judah until the very till this very day the word of the Lord has come to me and I have spoken to you again and again but you have not listened and though the Lord has sent all his servants the prophets to you again and again you have not listened or paid any attention they said turn now each of you from your evil ways and your evil practices and you can stay in the land the Lord gave to you and your ancestors forever and ever. That was the promise God gave. This will be your land forever and ever. You can stay here forever and ever. And these prophets were warning the people, do not follow other gods to serve and worship them. Do not arouse my anger with what your hands have made. Then I will not harm you. 
but you did not listen to me, declares the Lord, and you have aroused my anger with what your hands have made, and you have brought harm upon yourselves. Are you guys understanding this? God is telling them, we have a relationship. This is what I promised you. And I'm telling you, y'all ain't living up to your deal. You're worshiping other gods. You're sacrificing your children. There's another text that God says, I, you guys did things to your babies. I never, never even entered my mind. I had never asked you to do this. Made no sense to me. This is why God didn't want them serving other gods, because he knew they would be, they would be unjust and ungracious and unmerciful, not compassionate. All right, so go to verse 8. Therefore the Lord Almighty says this, because you have not listened to my words, I will summon all the peoples of the north. And my servant Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, declares the Lord, and I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants and against all the surrounding nations. I will completely destroy them and make them an object of horror and scorn and an everlasting ruin. This is what he's saying he's going to do to Israel. I will banish them I will banish uh, from them the sounds of joy and gladness, the voices of the bride and bridegroom, the sound of millstones and the light of the lamp. The whole country will become desolate wasteland, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. So God basically says, this is what I'm going to make Babylon do to you. My servant, Nebuchadnezzar, my servant, Nebuchadnezzar, is going to get y'all. God basically, from this text, says he will be inspiring all the destruction. That he will be the one motivating Nebuchadnezzar to kill their women and children. He's the one. And he's like, y'all brought this on yourselves. You made me so mad. I didn't want to hurt you, but now I have to. Now, does this sound like God? These are the words of God. But does it sound like God? It's okay for you to answer, at least in your heart. Does it sound like God or not? It doesn't. It's okay for us to say that. There's something wrong with this text. But pastor, scripture is inspired. No, 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 no. The authors are inspired. We believe in thought inspiration. Not word inspiration. Not every word was dictated. People were moved upon by the Holy Spirit according to, to Timothy and Peter. And they wrote as inspired people, but their filters were still broken. That is why the author of Hebrews has to say, Jesus, not the prophets, is the perfect radiance of God's glory. Meaning the exact representation of his character. Not Moses, Jesus. Because Moses might say something that's, hmm. In fact, even Jeremiah, you read the book of Lamentations? I know it's depressing, but Jeremiah goes off on God, blames God for smashing in his teeth against the rocks. And God is like, I didn't do that. Yes, you did. Because they did it to me, and you're God, and you're in control, so I blame you. Job says some crazy things about God. David, have you read all of the Psalms? The only Psalms I use as scripture reading in this church are the ones that are acceptable. I must exclude chapters from Psalms because David is bloodthirsty and wants revenge. There are some passages I can only give you the first eight verses of the chapter because the next verses are cray. He'll be like, sing unto the Lord a new song. Oh, he's worthy to be praised. Shout to the Lord, but dash my enemies' heads against the rocks. Well, we won't be saying that as a responsive reading. Because Scripture is an authentic, true reflection of humanity, both good and bad. And although God is perfect, he is still filtering his good news and his inspiration through imperfect vessels. And let me tell you, the message sometimes can be obscured. That's why some authors can say, it was God that tempted David to take a census because he wanted to pick a fight with Israel. Another author will say it was actually the adversary. 
but we must comb through Scripture and find, as one author says, uh, uh, that we must find the thread that runs from Genesis all the way through Revelation. And that's what we hold on to. So it doesn't sound like God, but let's keep reading here. Verse 12 in, in Jeremiah 25. But when the 70 years are fulfilled, I will punish the king of Babylon and his nation, the land of the Babylonians, for their guilt. Wait, wait, hold up. You're the one that made them do this to Israel, and now you're going to punish them after it? Yeah. But, but Lord, they did your will. Why would you punish them for being obedient to your Holy Spirit? I will punish them for their guilt and will make it desolate forever, which actually did happen. I will bring on that land all the things I have spoken against it, all that are written in the book and prophesied by Jeremiah against all the nations. They themselves will be enslaved by many nations and great kings. I will repay them according to their deeds and the work of their hands. In other words, they will reap what they have sown. Question. In any of these scenarios, did God himself ever lift a finger and do anything to Babylon? Did he do anything to Israel? What actually is going on here? The reason why God is punishing Babylon is because what they did is sinful. And God doesn't punish Babylon because they're sinful with his own heavy hand. What God is allowing is for life to happen and he's not protecting them from it. The way it's written, it's as if God is the one who is controlling and manipulating the entire situation. And because we don't understand at times how scripture is written and communicated, we can get lost in translation. But if you're looking at the text, and even later in Jeremiah, God simply says, because of your decisions, I'm going to give you freedom. Freedom to die by the sword, freedom to die by pestilence, freedom to die by famine. God doesn't say, I'm going to bring about the famine, I'm going to bring about pestilence, and I'm going to bring war. He says, I'm going to give you the freedom to experience life the way that everyone else does. People getting even with one another. People getting revenge. Now that's what you want. You want that government? That's the government of the enemy. You are going to have that now. I'm no longer going to protect you from your own choices. So Babylon is going to have its way with you. I'll get them back for what they did to you, but even getting Babylon back is simply God doing this, removing his presence. Because if God doesn't hold back the winds of strife, what happens, family? If God doesn't hold back the winds of strife, according to Revelation, what happens? All hell breaks loose. The only reason why we are not experienced the full, undiluted wrath of God is because he's holding back the winds, the satanic winds. The wrath of God has never been God rampaging. The wrath of God has always been him withdrawing. All right. When Jesus experienced the wrath of God on the cross, what was it? The sense of his father eternally separating from him. God in the Old Testament respects the choices of Israel. And when he does, he steps away. Now, you would say, but he should never step away, pastor. Oh, do you want to be around somebody who's so controlling they never leave you? They're always hovering over you. Anybody have parents like that? Helicopter parents are always over you. What are you watching? What are you doing? Let me see it. Let me see it. God says, okay, you don't want that. That's fine. Respect. I'll I'll remove myself from the situation. And only by removing himself from the situation did Israel actually get to see what that government of Satan and the rest of the world really looks like. In fact, one of the things that Jesus tells us in John chapter 16 is that the Holy Spirit is given to us so it can convict us on what righteousness is, on what sin is, and what real judgment is. And I want you to understand something here. The same God who says, if you live by the sword, you will die by the sword. The same God who says, turn the other cheek. The same God, the same God who in heaven, when there was war, never lifted a hand of violence. The war in heaven was never of swords and and axes. This wasn't Lord of the Rings. The war in heaven was a disagreement of words and ideology. And not even in heaven is God abusive. Not even in heaven. If God is going to resort to violence, he would have started from the very beginning. Why waste your time? 
If you want to torture us, God, and burn us forever, get started now. Why wait till the end? If you're going to be a big bully, you're going to use violence, and that's the way you're going to end the war, do it from the beginning. Why wait? So that you guys will feel I'm justified when I burn everybody. There's an inconsistent picture of God because we as people are inconsistent. There's a dichotomy, a, 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 a bipolar representation of God because we are. And depending on when we write and where we write, our picture of God can change. Listen to John the Baptist with thousands of people listening to him, baptizing, thousands of people say, behold the Lamb of God. I can't even lace his sandals. And listen to that same John the Baptist in a dungeon for two years. Hey, cuz, are you really the Messiah? Or should we look for another? Perspective changes, doesn't it? Depending on when you talk to Moses, depending on when you talk to Jeremiah, depending on when you talk to David, the reflection of the character of God can be obfuscated. And this is what we must understand when we read scripture. When we see these stories, we can say with clarity and conviction, this does not sound like God. Something must be off. And we cannot confuse the character of God, his goodness, his love, with life. The reason why Samson is such a vengeful person is because Samson has seen a lot of suffering in his life. The Philistines weren't kind people. Samson was doing what naturally we do when people hurt us. And God was allowing life to play out. So if you punch Samson and he has the power to get you back, he was going to do it. Even if it was a misuse of God's spiritual gift, it was still a reality check for Israel and for the Philistines. What God does, even at Calvary, watch this, and we're closing on this, what God does, even at Calvary, is give us a clear picture of Satan and his, and his kingdom and a clear picture of God and his kingdom. Even at the cross, you can see the hatred of man, the rebellious nature of man, the disgusting, ugly nature of sin at the cross, and you can see the unfiltered beauty and love of God. All converging in the same moment. That's why Paul can say in Colossians chapter 1, verse 19 and 20, that through the death of Jesus on the cross, that all things were reconciled, whether on earth or in heaven. In fact, Satan doesn't even fall until the cross. That's when he's cast out of heaven. It is only then and there. And watch this. It didn't require the sword of God in the way that you think. The sword of God is the word of God that comes from his mouth. It is the gospel. That was the sword that Jesus used. Not the sword of mankind. Not the sword of violence. Well, pastor, if Samson didn't do what he did, how else would they have defeated the Philistines? I don't know. How did he defeat the Egyptians? Maybe he would have sent more frogs. Right? Maybe he would have scorched their crops and not Samson. I don't know, but I can tell you this, there is always another way that will be a clear revelation of who God is. And just because the way that you chose may work out in the end doesn't mean you were in the will of God, you just had a God who was willing. Well, it all worked out, Pastor. We're still married. I'm like, yeah, but man, look at those therapy bills. And your children probably aren't too happy because all y'all do is fight, but we're still together. Well, hallelujah. There's an easy way and there's a difficult way. And God, it gives you the easy way all the time. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. We choose the most difficult path and there's drama that ensues. Just because God is willing doesn't make it his will. And so I submit to you that the Spirit of God came upon Samson to do wonderful things that will always be reflective of God's character. What Samson chose to do with his strength, 
I don't believe was a perfect reflection of the character of God. I'm sorry if that hurts your feelings. That doesn't mean the, the scriptures are not inspired. I just believe as we continue to see a clear revelation of Jesus and who God is, we can look back in scripture and say, oh, that didn't really look like Jesus there, did it? There are people that justify wars and the treatment of people based on these texts. Are you hearing me? There are people today, Israel, currently can justify some of their actions because of scripture like this. Oh, pastor, don't get political. I'm sorry. They can look at this and say, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. No, 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 no. You can't tell me, you can't tell me what happened to 100 people deserves what you did to 5,000. Hello? But pastor, don't do that. We have to be Zionists. We have to stop it. Chill. If I can call out that Samson's character is not like God, I'm going to call it out on everybody. And that doesn't make them any less his people. They still can be and still be dead wrong. But if you only saw what they did to babies, I get it, I get it. Jesus saw the same thing happen, and yet he says, into thy hands I commit my spirit. We are called to something higher. I know someone hurt you, and I know you want to get even, but spiritual strength does not involve righteous indignation. It does not involve vengeance. Spiritual strength will always represent itself with spiritual fruit, love, patience, kindness, joy, forgiveness. I want you to be spiritually strong, but stronger than Samson. A stronger character. We don't need to get even. Yes, that might be justice according to the world, but we're a part of another kingdom. And that kingdom looks at justice differently. And it forgives 70 times 7. And it turns the other cheek. And it does good to those who harm you. I love revenge movies. So much so that I've been in situations where I wanted revenge and I felt so justified. Then I met someone called Jesus. And I looked at him stretched on Calvary. And he didn't cry for fire to come out of heaven like Elijah. And he could have, and he deserved it. But he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Dad, these are our babies too. We're even coming for the uncircumcised. It's the Philistines that I love as well. It's the Palestinians and the Israel. I, I love them all. I love Osama and I love Obama. I love them all. I love Trump. I love Vice President Harris. I love them all. No, but they're your enemies. Even my enemies I love, and I've asked you to do the same. Let's get even. No, let's not get even. Grace does not get even. We want the Holy Spirit to fall on us. We want transformation. Because God is going to do something great in this church and in this community. And it starts with us. It starts with us seeing God clearly. If you can't see God clearly, you won't know when you're off mission. When you're no longer following the Great Commission, you'll feel justified. And today, I call out the sins of Samson. No, no, I'm not being judgmental. I'm calling them out. If you guys could see my chapter 14 and chapter 15 also in Judges, you would call out my sins as well. 
I'm going to ask the praise team to come here. We're going to sing just very shortly. We're going to ask again for this Holy Spirit to fall on us. I want you to think about what it is that God is calling you to as we sing these words. I want you to think about very deeply what God is calling you to. God is compassionate and he understands life and he understands the back and forth. He understands why Samson was angry and the Philistines in many ways got what they deserved because again, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Everybody's trying to get even with one another. God understands that government. He understands that system, but he brought a new system into play, a better one. And we're called to that one, amen? So Father, you hear us. We submit our lives to you again. You've given us spiritual gifts. We ask you to continue to trust us with those spiritual gifts and that we use them to your glory and honor. Holy Spirit, 